with us in the department. He's a, a very good physiologist. So there's a big team working on this stuff. So rootstock origin. Where, where do rootstocks come from? Why do we use rootstocks? Well, some of you up here are planting own rooted vineyards still, and you're going to realize very soon why we planted rootstocks, because blocks will get in them and eventually take those vineyards out. Uh, Blocker has been a, a constant threat around the world. The only places that have so far remained free of blocks are our, our southwestern Australia, south central Australia, and Chile. And no one really knows why in either case. In, in Australia, it's because of incredibly uh, strident efforts to keep the bug out of there. And they spent huge amounts of money just to keep the flock from the regions. And Chile seems to be pure luck. So at some point, we're gonna, we're gonna see that change as well. Uh, the good news about phloxera is, is it does not kill vineyards quickly. So if your neighbor brings in phloxera on a rooted rootstock cutting and it gets away, which is going to happen because the, those plants are infested oftentimes, if that vineyard's established on the roots, it will probably take another 10 or 15 years to see any impact of phloxera whatsoever. The next vineyard you replant on that same site will die in two or three years. So that, but that established vineyard will tolerate that pressure for quite some time. So it's always difficult. Every, every phloxera outbreak there's always a lot of name pointing and, and name calling and everything else that goes on. But in reality, those infestations started a whole lot longer than anybody realized. And it's very difficult to assess how they got there and where they came from. The key is planting on rootstock. So we can use rootstock for resistance. We can use rootstocks for tolerating drought more effectively. Uh, you can use them for both things. But planting on roots is risky anywhere in the world. And it's uh, one of those things that's it's so much, it's like a nice cheap insurance policy. It's not that much more expensive. You don't have to worry about those things ever again. Uh, when I started my talks in Australia about phloxera and how they're going to resist it, I would start them with, with, you people must be crazy, because they've gone through and doubled the size of their industry without rootstock. And they're still worrying every day about whether their vines are going to decline or whether they're going to fail. So it's really a, a critical component of viticulture, one of those things you just really should get used to as you go along. So it began, of course, in, in France, and we really haven't made any progress since then. So almost all the rootstocks we use were developed to address the phloxera crisis in the 1860s and 70s, a very long time ago. Rootstocks were produced, and the ones we still use were, were produced by, by 1900, uh, so they've been sitting around for 100 years without any real improvement. It's remarkable if you think about it. There's been a couple of newer rootstocks, Freedom, Harmony, there's a few more that have come out in the last few years, but otherwise, nothing. And life has changed since then. Uh, culture has changed since then. Cultivation techniques, uh, irrigation demands, all those things have changed quite a bit. So the first thing is, how do we get a rootstock? Well, the first and most important characteristic of a rootstock is it has to root. It has to root from dormant cuttings, and it has to be graftable. And, and I think that's sort of facetious, but of the American species, all of which are resistant, because Glauxer is a North American pest, of those species, only two root from dormant cuttings. It's extremely difficult to propagate any of the others. So that frustrated them a lot, and they brought back the two that root, Vitus riparia, Vitus rupestris, started making rootstocks out of those, hybridized them together to make other rootstocks, put them in vineyards, and experienced the second crisis. So people always wonder why Americans are treated so shabbily in Europe. And it's not because we wear Bermuda shorts and Hawaiian shirts all the time. It's because we introduced phylloxera, downy mildew, powdery mildew, black rot, and then these rootstocks we developed from American species were planted, failed a second time from Lyme-induced chlorosis. About 10 years later, those vineyards flourished, they did fine, everyone's happy, they collapsed one more time. Again, an American fault. So they came back to the U.S. and they met T.V. Munson, the father of American viticulture. If you've never read the Foundations of American Grape Culture, you should. It's a fantastic uh, treatise on the grape species and a lot of wisdom in there that's 100 years old. Uh, and he went through with the French and said, use Vitus berlandieri. It grows on these limestone soils from Dallas down to Mexico. Uh, in fact, they just got back from a collection trip in that same region a few weeks ago. Uh, and it, it resists lime beautifully. But it won't root from dormant cuttings. It won't propagate. So they had to take that and hybridize it with Rupestris and hybridize it with Riparia. And that's where we're at today. Okay? Why are we going to talk about that? Because if you understand these species, you understand what rootstocks to use. If you don't understand these species, you, you'll, you'll, you'll make mistakes. So the most commonly used one, Vitus riparia, propagates beautifully, known as riparia because it's growing in riparian habitats, and streamside habitats, on very fine alluvial soils most of the time that hold a lot of water, or directly in rivers and lakes. In this case, the Missouri River here, you can barely see, but all those trees are covered with Vitus riparia. If you fly anywhere in the Northeast, get out of the airport, and drive out, out, out of that region into the, into the forested spots, you will find tons of Vitus riparia. It's growing on everything. It's a fantastic plant. 
But it doesn't have a deep root system. It doesn't need a deep root system. It, it sort of grow, grazes for water across the top of the soil. It's not competing for anything. It's got lots of moisture, and it's a very weak, tenuous root system. I don't know if I put my slide in here about rootstocks, and I should tell you about them to start with. It's about grapevines, in fact. Because there's something you should know about grapes before you grow them, and one thing is that they're vines. And, and people think, well, what's the difference? They're not the same as trees. They're not the same as annuals. They're not the same as perennial shrubs. They're a plant that requires a root system to take up water and nothing else most of the time. So root systems are normally here for anchorage, for storage, and for water uptake. And grapes don't store anything in the roots. They don't, they, they don't anchor the plant. The plant is anchored by the tree it's growing in. All they exist for is taking up water. So when people tell you to establish your vines carefully, they're telling you that because they want you to avoid out-competing the root system. You first develop the roots, then you develop the plant. And that's the, the first major sort of dogmatic bit of, of information about rootstock and growing, growing vines in the first place. That root system does not compete for photosynthate very well. Almost everything goes to the shoot tips. The tips are there to grow up on top of the tree, to get in the sun, to get exposure, and to grow as fast as they can. That's what a vine is supposed to do. If it has anything left over, it puts it into that trunk system that's in the tree, that's hanging there in the branches and things. And at the very last, if there's anything left over, it goes into the root system. It's got a, in the wild, it only has to do half the time, half duty on, on providing fruit, because the wild vines are either male or female. Uh, so they're not the same thing. Female vines are always weaker because they have to partition stuff into the, into the fruit system. What we cultivate is perfect flower, so it's a little bit different. But the, the principles are the same. Number one, the shoot tips. Number two, the trunk. Number three, if you're lucky, the root system. And if you start partitioning what those vines are making, the root system's on the short end of the stick. Almost all the time. If grapes are like that, any vine is like that. They're not the same as real plants. So that's a, it's a key thing. So when you take advantage of that and say, well, let's train these vines up as fast as possible. I know I can get these things. In fact, I do that all the time in my breeding program. I take a seedling and can grow it up six feet tall in a season by careful removal of every single lateral, lots of water, lots of fertilization, and fruit it in the second year. No problem whatsoever. But I'm not depending on those plants to be a vineyard, right? The only reason they're growing that fast is so I can evaluate them, make another cross with them, and throw them away. Right? So I'm not, I'm not thinking about establishing that root system. And it's really key. It's the most important thing you'll do in that life of that vineyard is establish a good root system. It's, it's, it's paramount to dry farming because if you don't have a decent root system, you're not going to have anything left over. So there's riparia. There's Rupestris. Vitus Rupestris is St. George. Vitus Rupestris is, is Rupestris Gloire. We still use that. You'd be out of your minds to use it down here, but we still use that in various parts of the state with high rainfall, thick, thick alluvial soils where we want to cut down bigger a lot. So it's a different sort of plant. Rupestris is St. George, and here's where it usually grows. It used to grow from Pennsylvania all the way to Texas, all along the exact same route that the government set all the settlers in the 1840s and said, go west, young people, and hit the road in your wagons and take your, your cattle with you. And the cattle ate Rupestris. They destroyed it because it's a shrub. It's not a grape vine, it's a great shrub. And therefore, it behaves differently. It mines the soil very deeply, it penetrates the soil very quickly, uh, and puts a lot of resources into a root system. So that's a very positive thing. It's not at all drought resistant. It has zero drought resistance. It grows in creek beds. Wet creek beds, not dry creek beds. So how does it tolerate drought? It tolerates drought, I'm using those words differently now, resistance and tolerate. It tolerates it by having a very deep plunging root system that can mine for water more effectively. Okay, so that's a very positive thing. On the downside, it has no nematode resistance whatsoever. It has reasonably good flocks resistance, but it's not necessarily a good root stock for a lot of different sites because of its pest resistance. And there's the beauty, Vitus berlandieri. It won't root. I just brought back a pile of cuttings from 110 different collections we made over four days, raced them back to Davis, get them in the propagation beds, almost all died again and again and again. I keep trying, I'm persistent. Uh, but it grows on these incredibly dry spots. And this picture you can't see very well is of wild plum and mesquite that's dying after that five-year drought in Central Texas, and the Berlandi area is still growing. It's still active. It's not strong, but it's still actively growing though. So it has remarkable drought resistance, remarkable lime tolerance, and a different sort of response to water. That's a different sort of response entirely that we'll talk about here in a while. So it's sort of the key to, to solving this. Here's two other approaches to drought tolerance well, in this picture. The one is Vitus monticula. You can't see it because it's a very small plant anyway. It's growing on solid limestone. It doesn't grow at all though. That's how it resists drought. It turns out that that's how almost all dry climate plants resist drought. Any cactus you'll see, 
All the shrubs you see in this, in this chaparral here, they survive by not growing. That's the, that's the truth. So they partition very little new foliage each year, new generation. They just sort of wimp it along. Nothing else grows there to compete with them because they haven't been able to, and these plants survive because they have a broader tolerance of being completely dry. This other picture has one of my grad students in the circle at the bottom there, hanging <coughs> up with her arms high in the air, waving to me. She's not short. Uh, this is the Vitus candy cans, the Mustang grape of Texas. It's in Champinii, Vitus, uh, it's in uh, uh, Dog Ridge and Ramsey rootstocks, for instance, Salt Creek rootstock. That's 90 feet up a cottonwood tree. In fact, it's going to pull down that cottonwood tree. Grapevines usually die because they can't compete with the trees. This is one that outcompetes the trees entirely. So it has a massive root system to supply this giant plant, a huge root system proportionately. And that's how it tolerates drought. It just keeps growing and developing. Again, maybe not something you want. Here's one, my monticula doesn't grow at all. And here's candy cans that grows way too much. It produces rugged trees instead of grapevines. It's a different sort of problem. And usually people ask me uh, this, this question, isn't there a cactus gene out there that's going to help us with this some way? And the answer is no, unfortunately. And half a drought tolerance and half a drought understanding, half a breeding for these things is realizing the answer is no, because it's much more complicated than we think. It's not a simple, a simple approach to solving this problem. So breeding ground stocks, we could, we could breed them to, to uh, continue to grow when exposed to water stress. That's, that's one of the, way, the ways we want to look at this. They're, they're able to actually grow and generate decent plant material. Uh, really, probably the best definition of drought tolerance is producing decent amounts of crops with much less water. So people always ask me, particularly in the San Joaquin Valley, how can I, what's going to happen if I give my grapes half as much water? And I tell them, you're going to get half as much crop. And the question is, can you eke a living back, somehow give them half as much water, and still generate maybe 80% as much crop, or 75% as much crop? And the answer is, we might be able to do that, but it's not clear. So usually, less water means less crop. And we, particularly in these areas where we're pushing things really aggressively, uh, we're going to experience declines in yield, for sure. And whether we can sustain that is the other question, economically. So we have this idea of adaptation and resistance. We've already mentioned that, sort of talked about those two sort of concepts. This other idea is root architecture. How do we actually select for root architecture? And what does that mean? Well, we know some of these root systems go down, primarily. Some go horizontally, primarily. A good example would be uh, 110R, which goes down primarily, and 10114, which doesn't go down at all. It just floats across the surface of the soil. It hardly penetrates at all. It's maybe one of the worst root socks that we can mm -hmm. use in California. If California is a dry summer climate, the last choice you would want is a wimpy rootstock that couldn't really do well during the season. And that's 114. Mm -hmm. We can keep it alive very easily with judicious irrigation, particularly light, light frequent irrigations. Uh, but when you start thinking about it growing it with, under dry conditions, it fails most of the time. So it can be a big, a big negative from those perspectives. Why is there so much 114? It's the easiest rootstock to propagate. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Not necessarily the most useful rootstock in California, but it's the most easily propagated. So there's more of it available. And that's one of the choices when you go to a nursery. You're not going to be able to get the best choice oftentimes. And in fact, there may not be a best choice, but you need to avoid the bad choices. And there's one that we would classify as a bad choice, unless you have a lot of water, unless you're looking at close spacings, unless it's a very fine alluvial, text, uh, fine textured soil, uh, then you might be okay. It's a funny root system. Would you want to cultivate with this? Would you want to create your dust mulch? with a very shallow root system, right? Because you're going to chop in little pieces all year long and ruin it. Uh, so it's another one you want to avoid from that perspective. Please. OK. Um, it turns out that there's two sorts of roots in the grapevine. They're the structural roots. They're sort of permanent and do store water. And we've always thought of them as not taking up water. They actually do take up water. They take up water through even finger-sized roots that are in the soil. And there's the fine feeder roots that do take up water. Those are the ones we think about as being responsive to irrigation and things, the fine small roots that work out after you irrigate and mine. And they don't form the same way from all the species. Riparia forms these new feeder roots very quickly. Berlandieri doesn't form them at all sometimes. They're very slow to establish them. Uh, and things like Lopestris are sort of more intermediate. They have sort of a different root, sort of root system. We have root systems that are completely flat, ones that are completely deep, and ones that are intermediate. So all those two things those, the idea of the feeder root, water uptake, is, is one part of this. And the other part is how deep those roots are mining the soil. How we can exploit that and understand it more effectively. The tricky part is, grapes have very few roots. If you're not drip irrigating, and you go up to a vine, and take a shovel and start digging, 
you'll be, you'll be lucky to find roots. It's unusual to find roots in the dry farm vine. There are very, very few of them. And if you pull up and you excavate that vine over many years without drip irrigation, you're going to notice there are very few roots there, maybe three or four main structural roots, and the rest are all roots that branch off of those. So there's a very limited original structure. And no one knows why that happens. <coughs> it's the reason that J-rooting, I don't know if we go off tangents a lot, but one of the things we can go off tangents about is J-rooting, and improperly planting grapevines, by not allowing the roots to go downwards, by bending them either flat or actually upwards, you'll kill that vine. And you would think, well, big deal. It loses that root, it'll grow another one. It'll replace that root and be fine. It doesn't grow another root. It doesn't produce another one of these structural main roots that comes off that shaft of the, of the, of the plant. And that's because that shaft of the plant that we planted the ground is stem. It's not root, right? It's, it's stem tissue. It doesn't really form roots the same way as a seedling would, for instance. If we plant these things with seedling, we'd be fine. But of course, the vineyard would be a mess. So it's a different sort of perspective. So all these concepts have to be sort of worked together. When, when my job is to breed a better rootstock, how am I going to do that? You know, what am I what am I selecting for? What am I aiming for? And I'm, I'm aiming for all these things at the same time. We're trying to figure out how they work and whether we can exploit them more effectively.